Welcome everybody to Prophecy USA. This is a Bible study prophecy podcast specifically designed to unveil the hidden mystery of America's role in Bible prophecy. Uh, my wife Karen cannot join us tonight, but she says hi, and uh, next week she'll probably be with us. Uh, before we begin tonight, I want to remind you we're having people email us at Karen at Prophecy USA to get these bumper stickers and window stickers for your car. It's a great witnessing tool. People ask, what is Prophecy USA? And our partners are saying it's a TV program specifically designed to unveil the hidden mystery of America's role in Bible prophecy. That gets a lot of people's attention to watch our television show on 150, uh, 100, 130 roughly, 130 TV stations across the nation. Canada and the U.S., and of course, uh, our podcast every Thursday uh, that we have, which you're joining us right now. Before I begin tonight, uh, first of all, we, we are doing part three of our interviews with Pastor Jack Hibbs, Rabbi Jonathan Kahn, and Rabbi uh, Jason Sobel. Now, the first week, we discussed what in the Word is happening in America, the next, the next week, we questioned about America, and the third week, which is now, is America under judgment. Before we begin that, I want to read a letter from a partner. Uh, this comes from uh, an 83-year-old missionary, and she said, I am home on furlough and happen to come across Rick's teaching on television, Prophecy USA. I found his message to be point on and interesting. I've been studying prophecy since 2005. Folks, that's 18 years of studying. And when I heard Rick speak, I was amazed. And I said to myself, this is unbelievable. What I like is that he is not like many out there today, regurgitating and repeating what others are saying. Also, he's so accurate in his points, which are scripturally based. And I find this to be amazing and fascinating. His ministry is a lot like Jeremiah's. Well, Jeremiah was stoned to death. <laughs> so, <laughs> oddly enough, we're using Isaiah and Jeremiah's uh, descriptions of a Latter-day nation called Babylon the Great. And those men were martyred for the words that they gave. Now... We want to thank you. That comes from Yvonne. Thank you, Yvonne, for that, for that word of encouragement um, to be put in the same category as Jeremiah is, uh, is a real honor. I hope that my life doesn't end like Jeremiah's, uh, but I found that, that very interesting. I have had at least a half a dozen people tell me that they felt my ministry was like Jeremiah. Uh, of course, Jeremiah was told to go and give a word. And the Bible says, I believe it's in Jeremiah 7. He says, go and deliver this word, but they will not listen to you, Jeremiah, because they will not listen to me. Now, uh, Ezekiel was told, go and speak to the children of Israel. They will not listen to you because they will not listen to me. And then there's another verse that says God would send forth a prophetic word even though people would not listen. But when the event takes place, then they would know that I sent them a word of warning. For surely the Lord will do nothing except he reveal it unto his servants, the prophets. Now, here's someone that wrote us a letter. And uh, this fellow is a traditional thinker. And we're just going to read this letter in my response before we begin with our teaching. He says, show me America in the Bible. A word cannot be validated unless it's in the Bible, folks. You all need to read Deuteronomy 4.2 where Moses says, You shall not add to the word which I am commanding you, nor take away from it, that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God which I command you. The only way in which we can rightly keep God's word or God's commands is not to add or subtract from his word. 
Switching revelation around to suit your prophecy is wrong. This is false doctrine at its highest. What he's basically doing is saying, I'm teaching a false doctrine for saying that America is in Scripture. Is God lacking and needs you to replace words and switch the timeline around? Get behind me, Satan, he says. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. That's in the Revelation. You severely edited uh, one of your uh, interviewers' teachings and you purposely did not, didn't come right out and ask him if America was in the Bible. Well, folks, I'm going to tell you something right now. The, inter the people that we're interviewing are not agreeing with me that America's in the Bible. And I'm going to explain that a little, a, a little further. But we're meeting together on common ground. We're meeting together on common ground. Now, he said that I've adjusted the words here. I've, uh, I've taken things out of context. And this is how... I am responding to this young man. The words Russia, Saudi Arabia, Iran, Turkey, and the United States of America are not in the Bible. You cannot find those words in this book. However, the name Gog and Magog, Persia, Togomar, and Sheba and Dedan, and Babylon, are in the Bible. The word rapture's not in the Bible, and neither is the word trinity, but their descriptions are. Now these names that I just read are regions and are described as the offspring of Noah in Genesis chapter 10 that later become Russia and Saudi Arabia, Iran and Turkey. Babylon in the Bible has 53 biblical descriptions by four different prophets. The United States of America meets every description. And if you research our findings, you will discover, you will discover that. However, if you fly off the handle like you just did in some emotional frenzy, you'll never be able to unveil the secret things in the Bible that the Lord reveals, especially for the latter days. Remember that the words are sealed until the latter days, according to Daniel. It says, the wise will understand, but the wicked will not. The word waits for its appointed time to be fulfilled. Folks, all of the fulfillments, the descriptions of Babylon have been fulfilled in the last 50 years in the United States of America. And our mission at Prophecy USA is to unveil the mysteries that are placed in Scripture concerning America. These men are helping, the men that I'm going to interview tonight, are helping the body of Christ understand what in the Word is happening in America, which oddly enough is exactly how Babylon falls into darkness and fulfills the descriptions in prophecy. All of our research found, all of our research at Prophecy USA is found at rickpearson.com. You can go. It's all free, folks. And most people following us are mature students of the Word. And so what we encourage you to do is 2 Timothy 2.15, study to show thyself approved unto God, rightly dividing the Word of God. So uh, we want to thank that young man for his comments, but we also want to say that we're not changing anything, folks. We're not changing anything in this book. We've got the time sequences, we've got the descriptions, and the United States of America is in the Bible. Now, Pastor Jack Hibbs in his, in his book Countdown discusses the differences between God's judgment and God's wrath. This week, we're going to, uh, this podcast, the title is, Is America Under Judgment? And you know, most people today don't want to hear the J word, judgment, from the pulpits. You won't hear that in the nation. And it's usually about prosperity and deliverance and abundance. 
uh, healing, and all, those are all good things. But God is a God of grace, forgiveness, patience, and love. But did you know in Isaiah 61 it says, For I, the Lord, love judgment, I hate robbery for burnt offering, and I will direct their work in truth, and I will make an everlasting covenant with them. God does not judge those who are in covenant with him and are judging themselves. Look what he says about a covenant people, even when a nation's under judgment, and their seed shall be known among the Gentiles, and their offspring among the people, and all that shall see them shall acknowledge them, that they are the seed which the Lord hath blessed. I will, regret, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he hath clothed me with the garments of salvation. He hath covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decketh himself with ornaments, and as a bride adorneth herself with her jewels, for as the earth bringeth forth her bud, and as the garden causes the things that are sown into it to spring forth, so the Lord will cause righteousness to spring forth before all the nations. Folks, that righteousness is the righteousness of God that he places inside of us so that we do his will instead of our will. And we're supposed to bloom in whatever garden God has planted you. Now, Rabbi Jonathan Contonite will share with us his thoughts on why he believes that judgment is eminent in this nation unless we turn back to God. The book that we're, we're highlighting is called The Josiah Manifesto, and he will also give us a biblical response of what we should do if we find ourselves not right with God and how to come back to him. And in concluding... Our interviews tonight, Rabbi Jason Sobel is going to share from a Jewish perspective what we at Prophecy USA have taught in our book, The Coming Exodus, and it centers around this verse. Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord, before the husbandman waits for the precious fruit of the earth, and hath long patience for it, until he receives the early and the latter rain. Folks, the coming exodus, our, our, our third book that we wrote, we interpret the early and latter rain to mean the Old Testament anointing coming upon the New Testament church. Now this verse was written 15 years after the day of Pentecost. 15 years after the day of Pentecost, James says, the husbandman, Jesus, waits for the precious fruit of the earth until he receives the early and the latter rain. We believe something's going to happen before the rapture takes place, before that exodus takes place. We believe the Old Testament anointing, God is going to warn his church with signs and wonders before that. It'll be the last altar call, the very last altar call in America before God gives her her, her final judgment. There's a lot more to talk about that in Jeremiah 51, but we just don't have time, folks, to get into that. Right now, we're going to let Pastor Jack explain to us the difference between judgment when he judges nations and then wrath when he pours his wrath upon, among all the nations of the earth during the tribulation period. Now, remember, Babylon must be diminished or destroyed before the new world order comes in. We didn't change one word in this book. We just, we just found the time sequences in it. And it's all there, folks. Before the marriage of the Lamb takes place, Revelation 19, 1 through 7, Babylon will burn in one hour. And there's eight verses to back that statement. So without any further ado, here's uh, Pastor, Pastor Jack Hibbs from uh, uh, Chapel Hill in California explaining the difference between judgment and wrath. And you are there. So that's the verse, come out of her, my people, be not partaker of her sins. That could be a verse saying, 
come out of the darkness, come to the light. I'll protect you before judgment yep. comes. So in Jeremiah, it, it, you, you mentioned Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, Jeremiah prophesied that historical Babylon would judge Israel for 70 years, but then God would judge Babylon. So do you think it's possible that persecution of believers in America could provoke God to judge America, but he won't judge us? He will not judge the remnant, but he'll judge those that are judging oh, us. Absolutely. No doubt about that. Listen, first of all, our sins were judged at the cross in Christ. There are personal judgments that God levies against a sinner. In our case, as believers, he levied that judgment upon Christ. That's why you need to come to Christ. The other form of judgment is national judgment. Yeah, national judgments deal with God, God recompensing the nations as a whole. And within those nations, God, like you mentioned Israel, God will preserve his people. It doesn't mean that we're all going to we're going to be loved and hugged by everybody. Jesus said you're going to be hated, but he's also able to keep yes. us. And I love Luke 21, 36. Jesus said, when you see all these things coming to pass and that begin to happen, look up, right? Because your redemption draws near. He says you'll escape these things that are coming. It literally uses the word escape. Luke 21, 36, while all this is coming upon the earth, we should always be ready to meet the Lord, even right now today, by putting our faith in him. We're not to put our faith in any nation. Look, I was born and raised in, in California, in the United States. But my faith, as much as I have studied George Washington, my faith is not in George Washington. Okay, my faith, my faith right. is in Christ. My true citizenship, I have a U.S. passport. But thank God, I have a passport for heaven. That's That has been purchased for me by the blood of Christ, the Bible says. And my citizenship is in heaven. That's where I'm going. In the meantime, I'm going to take every opportunity to tell every single human being I can that Jesus Christ loves them, that we need to repent of our sins, follow him because he's Lord and Savior, and that he wants you to be in heaven with him. But you must accept that offer. He's not going to he's not going to bend your arm or put you in a headlock. You've got to willingly say, "Yes, Lord, I choose to follow you." And then from that moment on, my friend, I tell you what, for 46 years, almost 47 years I've been following Jesus, and I can't believe the life he has given me. It has been an incredible ride. Rick, I could die today at the age of 46 and rejoice in the fact that did I say 46? 64. 64. I could... 40. No, wait. You're 64. Okay. No, I'm 65. Boy, am I messed up. <laughs> 65 years old, I'm telling you right now, I could die today having lived a full life because Jesus has led me all along the way. To God be the glory. It's been an amazing, amazing life. Well, that's, that's what Jesus said. You know, I came that you might have life and have it more abundantly. And that that's what, of course, I'm a graduate of Oral Roberts University. So, I mean, I was in, I was indoctrinated yes. with that. But uh, you give, we're, we're talking about judgment. Now, you talked about the nations and, and we're talking about persecution that's coming. So, in a sense, God used Nebuchadnezzar mm -hmm. to judge his people. Yep. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego would not bow. They got thrown into the fire. God did not stoke the fire, but he did rob the flames That's of right. their violence. So we're here now, and it looks like we're heading into a position where the modern culture, I call it the Babylonian mm -hmm. culture, is coming against us. And for a, a certain period of time, we may have some judgment. But you give five verses supporting pre-tribulation rapture and your final verse that you use is god hath not pointed us to wrath but to obtain salvation by our lord jesus christ what's the difference between god's judgment and god's wrath can, can you explain the wrath and and his judgment we're in a judgment yes. right now Very we're in judgment no doubt. right now, America is. No doubt. And, and, I, and I don't think it's only Canada and America. 
I think even, you know, you look at some of the issues in Israel where God is allowing judgment to manifest. Great question, Rick. Listen, beautiful. Number one, judgment. God will always exercise judgment with hopes or with anticipation of us repenting. Ek homo legeo. The word metanoia is to repent. Ek homo legeo is to say the same word that God does about our sin. Uh, so you've got judgment where God is wanting, asking, pleading with you to turn around. When judgment has expired, for example, uh, Noah was 120 years in building the ark, it says, and that he was a preacher of righteousness. That's interesting, isn't it? But when no one would listen, when no one would listen, then wrath came. Here's the difference. Ra uh, judgment is to get people to turn around. Wrath is when God says, that's it. I turn you over. I'm done talking. End, end of chance. Wrath yes. is now falling. America is in the state of judgment. Our prayer is that America would repent. And that voice has got to come from its spiritual leaders, not from the White House. It's got to come from God's house. Yes. If Christians repent yes. in America, then there's going to be hope for the nation. If Christians don't repent, right, then the nation's going to slip from judgment into wrath. We are the salt and light. We are the ones that can issue hope if we would just speak it, if we would just announce the truth of God. He wants us to announce that he is a God that's not willing that any should perish but all should come to repentance. That's exactly. that's part of his judgment. Exactly. In his judgment, the scripture says, Lord, remember mercy. But you notice, you know this, Rick, that when the word of God says that God's wrath was being brought, there is no mercy in his wrath. His wrath is pure, it's just, it's perfect, it's holy, and it cannot be stopped. His wrath is unstoppable. Okay, now I'm going to ask you a question um, concerning Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, according to Genesis 19, uh, there were two angelic visitors came to warn uh, Lot of the impending judgment. And the night before Sodom and Gomorrah was destroyed, a large group of men paraded down the street, insisting that the angelic visitors engage sexually with them. Do you believe that the spirit gods? have something to do with the parades in the modern world in North America? And if, if so, could you explain that from a Hebrew perspective? Now, Lot didn't come to judge people. He came to warn people, you're going the wrong way. So how does that fit in with your book, The Return of the Gods? You're not here to judge people. You're here to warn people. We're here, we're here to save people, and we're here to deliver yes. people, and we're here to set people free. You know, many yes. people have come out of all these things and gotten saved. You know, and that's what we're that's why we're here. Again, is there, but for the grace of God, go all of us. But thank God, we thank God we're saved. We are here to warn and to to ultimately save. It's about life. So yeah, so they're actually there. The the enchantress or the transformer was that goddess. You know, who turned men into women actually was the goddess of parades. And she actually, I, I put it into the Return of the Gods. You actually see the inscriptions. It says, the people of Sumer parade before you. She made the people parade. Now, what kind of parades did they have? The parades they had were she, she caused men to parade in the city streets dressed up as women. Women in the city streets parading as men. It, the, parade, the parades were filled with color. They were filled with licentiousness and with the bending of gender. Does that sound familiar? Well, they're yes. back. Um, that's number one. Number two, here, here, she actually claimed one month of the year where she especially possessed the culture. And you know that when I looked, Rick, at the original writings of the early Christians, and and because it was still happening back then, uh, and I looked at the writings of Saint Jerome. Saint Jerome identifies the month of uh, parades, processions. But you know what it was, and gender. You know what it was. Have it's no the idea. month of he calls it Iunium or or in, in Latin, Junium, or the month of June. Well, June has returned to what to its pagan form. You know, remember, Jesus said that the spirits go back to the house they have. 
Well, the, this goddess possessed June. She's gone back to that house. And do you know what one of one of the key signs of this goddess was? Was the, uh, this is, and listen, this is right there in the in the Sumerian uh, inscriptions. It's there. Was the sign of the rainbow. So it's no accident what we're seeing now. And I will so I will even tell you how how. How big this is that it's even affected the Supreme Court in America. Example, there were three decisions by the Supreme Court that changed marriage, changed sexuality, ended with the famous uh, 2015 when marriage was redefined forever. Well, it started in 2003, three decisions over 12 years. Um, so here's the thing. Every one of them took place in June. In the, in, the, in the specific time of June, near the summer solstice, which is the time of the goddess, each one took place on June 26th, the same exact day, and that the date was linked to the goddess, and not that the Supreme Court knew what it was doing, it just happened. But on top of it, if you remember the day when the light, when the when President Obama lit up the yes. White House as a rainbow yes. to celebrate marriage, well, you know what? That night on the ancient calendar, but the biblical calendar and the Babylonian calendar was the 10th day of the month of Tammuz. The 10th of Tammuz. By the way, the Tammuz, the, the, the name Tammuz is already linked to the goddess. It was part of her mythology. I won't even go into it. But the 10th of Tammuz, I, I, I found a Babylonian inscription that said that day is appointed to cast a spell to cause a man to love a man. That was the day that marriage was changed. So, so most of our regular viewing audience uh, on Prophecy USA have been taught that the covenant nation of America was built upon Judeo-Christian principles of the Ten Commandments. And in fact, uh, the statue of Moses sits at the peak of the Supreme Court in Washington, D.C. So basically what you're saying that these gods or spirits can actually affect the rulings of the Supreme Court. Uh, or the exact times they're handed down, and Moses is looking down, watching this with the Ten Commandments yeah. in his hand, and we're walking away from our Judeo-Christian foundation, and we might be walking in a direction that has a steep cliff at the end of it. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah it does, and the thing is that that when you look, uh, Rick, you know, it's amazing you said that. I actually mentioned the book that you know, it, it's Moses holding the Ten Commandments, but when he held the Ten Commandments, he looked down and he looked and he saw his nation worshiping a golden calf and a nation in apostasy. And then he smashed those. So now you still have the face of Moses. By the way, not only the Supreme Court, but you also, when, when the Supreme Court was actually doing these things, it's actually going against the, way, the ways of God, you have Moses there, you know. But not only that, when, when the president speaks at the State of the Union, you know, when he stands there, there's one face looking down on him, directly down front, it's the face of Moses. Looking down on America, it's like a replaying of what happened at, at Mount Sinai with the Golden Gaff. Exactly. Which brings us right back that we're a covenant nation just like Israel. Is God cut a, a covenant with Israel, but America cut a covenant with God. We don't replace Israel, but we are a second covenant nation. Do you believe that in your heart? Oh, yeah. There's, well, well, there's a difference. Yeah, the distinction is that that Israel, you know, God God made the covenant with Israel. And Israel, there's no, you know, Israel is Israel, that, that, you know, that whole thing. That's it. But America is unique because, number one, it's the only other civilization that we know of that was founded from the beginning because of God, not, I mean, exactly. because of, not because of tribes, not because of ethnicity, not because of territory, but it was dedicated by the Puritans to God. And the Puritans actually dedicated America to, to be set up after the pattern of Israel, after the pattern of uh, an Israel in the new world. You know, so it's clearly that. But here's the here's the thing, uh, Rick, if you look at all my books, you know, or, or most of them, you know, from the harbinger to the paradigm to the return of the gods, the harbinger to what what you'll see is that there's something there. And that is that everything that happened to Israel when it turned away from God is happening to America and the West right now. Like right. clockwork, yeah. the sign harbinger. The harbinger showed the signs that came in the last days of Israel. The the paradigm showed the people and the events that we are replaying from Israel. Uh, the harbinger too says it's continued. The return of the gods are the gods and spirits that were there. So it's all part of this. So you know the 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 blessing is. You remember John Winthrop and <laughs> that we knew yes. John Winthrop. Puritan said, "If we follow God, we'll be the most blessed 
people on earth. Well, it happens. He said, you know, we'll be like Israel. He said, we'll be like Israel. That's the whole thing was based on Israel. But he said, if we turn away from God, then the judgments that came on Israel will come upon us. And, and that's exactly where we are now. Everybody forgets that, that that other part. They overlook the warning. But that's exactly what I'm telling, what I'm sharing, what I'm writing right now. That's where we are. The, the gods have come back and they're dangerous. And they're affecting everybody who's watching. And in Ezekiel 33, 8 and 9, uh, I believe it says that uh, I desire not the death of the wicked, but that the wicked would come back and be restored. You are not judging anyone for their lifestyle, but you do feel led to warn people that we're heading somewhere with the way that the society is going. Where do you believe we're heading to? Is there hope? Well, well, first off, yeah, there's always hope. And as long as there's God in every one of my books ends with hope. The last part of the book is called The Other God, which is about the true God and the power. And I'll and I'll I'll, I'll show I'll share that in a second. But just to say this, keep this in mind. When the gods came back, in a sense, think about this, they they come back with a vengeance because they were cast out by the gospel. So what have they been trying to do? They've been trying to cast the gospel, the word of God, out of the culture ever yes. since. And that's yes. exactly what we're saying. It makes sense. They were also cast out by Christians. So they have a target on Christians, on religious freedom, on anybody who stands for the ways of God. They're coming under more and more judgment by the state. Some are even being arrested. It happened, it's happened in, Amer in Europe, Canada, America, in different degrees. But that's another thing. You know, see, the gods never come back to have tolerance. You know, they, the tolerance is to get through the door. So back in the 60s, it was anything goes, hey, just be open. It was to get in the door of a Christian civilization. Once they get in, though, then it's every knee shall bow to Baal. Every knee shall, every tongue shall confess to Ashtora. That's where we are now. So notice how it turned from anything goes to now nothing goes except what we say must go. And, and you know, you you must think and talk and and work and live as we tell you, or we're going to cancel you. You know, and so that is exactly what has happened. So we are in that day right now, and this is very much about the end times. So what do we do? As you say, is there hope? Well, the future, first of all, for the nation, if America doesn't turn, if there's no revival, without revival, America's lost. Without revival, America's Canada done. is lost. Without revival, the world, you know, the West is lost. But so if there's no revival, it's going to go, it's going dark because that, because the end of these things with these gods is not good. It's always destruction. And when you look at that, we look at what the Bible says about the last days, it goes right in line with all everything we just said. But, but now what about, what about, is there hope? There is hope for the one who turns to God. There is hope for believers. First of all, remember something. You know, when Moses crossed the Red Sea, he, he wrote a song. He said, Micha mocha ba'elim Adonai, who is like you, O Lord, among the gods. There's no comparison between the one true living God and any God in this world. The, the, the people of God have the power to overcome all things. Look what the name of Jesus did 2,000 years ago. Cast spirits out of an entire civilization. Everyone who's listening right now who's got Jesus, you have that same power. But remember something. Remember Gideon. Gideon was a great hero in the Bible, but he could not become a great hero. He could not fight the good fight until he did something. In his backyard, there was an altar to Baal. He had to get rid of that altar had in his own backyard it. before he could fight the armies of Baal on the battlefield. So same with all of us. If there's anything in your life that is not of God, that is another God, that's an idol, or something that's out of, out of his will, that it's a stronghold that links up with it, like for pornography or anything like that. It links up with it. Get it out of your life. Do what Gideon did. Smash the altar. Smash it so you cannot even touch it anymore. Then God will use you powerfully for the day you live in. And remember right. something when you look, Rick, at what is happening in the world. You know, this is this is a one, it's not new in one sense. I mean, it's 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 an unprecedented degree and, and form, but this is what Moses dealt with. He dealt with the gods of Egypt. Elijah dealt with a god Baal. You know, Jeremiah dealt with a god Moloch. Uh, Paul dealt with the gods of Rome. So did the first believers. So every, the biblical person pretty much had to stand against the spirits of the age and stand against the sacred cows of the age. That is our, that is our heritage. That is our honor. We have the honor of living in such a time as this. You know what, Rick, what's the most exciting part of a movie? 
the last 15 minutes. So that's where God put us. And so we have the honor of standing when it comes. So if the dark is getting darker, it is time for the lights of God to get brighter. And to remember that the God you have, there's only one true living almighty, uh, omniscient, eternal God. And that's the God who lives with you, who you have. If you received him, Jesus, you've been born again. You've got that God. If you haven't been born again, you need to be born again. Do you think it's possible that God might give us the same type of signs and wonders that he gave Egypt? before he, he he lets this world go into the tribulation, which is a seven-year judgment and wrath of God. But do you think it's possible the Old Testament anointing could come upon the New Testament church for, for a, a short period of time as a final warning? Is that is that in Scripture? I, absolutely. I mean, look, I, I think that absolutely. I mean, I think on a number of different levels. I mean, I think Yeshua, Jesus said greater things than these you will do that's one thing it also says in the prophet micah as it uh, i will once again show you signs and wonders as in the days i brought you forth out of the land of egypt jeremiah 16 says therefore the days are coming quickly declares adonai will no, it will it will no longer be said as the lord lives who brought the children of israel out of the land of egypt but rather as adonai lives who brought the children of israel from the lands of the north, from all the lands where he had banished them. So there's lots of scriptures that show that you know, in preparation to the coming redemption, leading up to it, there are going to be miracles like there was in the days of the coming forth out of the land of Egypt. I, I, absolutely. I believe we're going to see them, that, experience them, yes. That's exactly what Oral Roberts said. His ministry was a forerunner of signs and wonders that would come before the second coming. And, you know, you know I, uh, I had an encounter with the Lord and the Lord spoke to me from, he said, the greatest revival that the world has ever seen is coming, but it's not rooted in fear. It's rooted in love and in demonstrating demonstration of his goodness with supernatural healing and transformation for the world to see that will turn people's hearts towards him so i absolutely believe that that is one of the keys to prepare for the return of the messiah theological seminaries have inundated churches preaching that america is not in the bible Prophecy teachers have regurgitated for years that America is not in the Bible. But what does the Bible say? Prophecy USA is proud to present a 30-page brochure filled with scripture, debunking the biggest lie keeping the body of Christ in darkness today. America is fully detailed in scripture over 53 times, and now we want to put God's word directly into your hands. America's role in Bible prophecy is rapidly being fulfilled and her judgment is coming. For a gift of $15 plus shipping and handling, we will send you this amazing brochure. For a gift of $50, we will send you five brochures. For $100 or more, we will rush to you 10 brochures. And for a ministry gift of $500, we will send you both our books, The Hour That Changes Everything, and The Coming Exodus, plus 20 brochures for your friends, family, and relatives. Call today. So it'll be God's final altar call. Absolutely. I mean, again, I believe there's a biblical principle, which is as it was in the beginning, so will it be in the end. Whether that was in the days of the redemption from Egypt, the most defining event for the Jewish people in history, or whether it was in the book of Acts, where we saw supernatural healing and transformation, I believe that we're going to see an unprecedented unprecedented move of God, that those who are open to God, open to the Lord, are going to, it's what's going to open their hearts and a great revival will occur as a result of I, it. I believe that and I'm praying for that. Now, if there's anyone listening and they're blue or they're dark or they don't feel hopeless or they feel hopeless, could you just pray a prayer of salvation for them and lead them to the cross where redemption is. Could you just do that? And you folks that are listening, uh, feel free to join along with Rabbi as he 
as he prays this prayer with you. Yeah, I, I just want to encourage you that, as we said, darkness in the Bible is associated with sadness and depression, disconnection, isolation. Yeshua came to bring the light of salvation. If you place your faith in him, you go from the darkness into the light. You go from the sadness and the gladness. So the most important thing is to receive him. We're going to pray in a moment, but also maybe you know, maybe you know the Lord, maybe you know Jesus, Yeshua, but you've gone through a really hard season. You've gone through some really tough things. We're also mm -hmm. going to pray and just believe that God is going to do something in your life because on the Hebrew calendar, this is a decade of breakthrough. This is a time to come out of Egypt, the place of that confinement and restriction in your life. And so God doesn't want you to live in that place anymore. Amen. He wants to bring you that freedom. So just, you can pray with me, Lord, I just invite you, Jesus, into my heart, into my life. I believe that you died for me because I fell short. I've broken your commandments. I have messed up. And I ask God for all the times that I've fallen, all the times that I failed, all the times that I've hurt someone. I ask God because Jesus died for me, was buried and rose again. I receive that forgiveness that you offer me. And I ask you to take residency in me. And I ask you to make me a new creation. I ask that the old would pass away and that the new would come and that I would experience your salvation, your freedom, your transformation. I give you my pain. And I ask that you turn it into promise. I give you my disappointments. And I ask that you'd give me your hope. I give you my heaviness. And I ask for the lightness. I give you my depression. And I ask for the joy and the gladness. Turn my mourning into dancing. And restore my hope. My future will be better than my past. Because you died for me you rose again and therefore i can rise and overcome every situation and circumstances in my life i thank you for what you did in the name of jesus amen folks we hope you enjoyed our interviews with these three great teachers of god's word you know interviewing guests like these is a protocol we are using at Prophecy USA to find truth in Scripture. And it's been said that history never repeats itself exactly, but it certainly does rhyme. And the Bible says that when it comes to prophecy, we all see through a glass darkly. In other words, we read this book with the spirit of the law and not necessarily the letter of the law. Now, our guests tonight may not agree on every letter of the law, but we certainly agree on the spirit of the law and what's happening in America and around the globe. So as time marches on and as prophecy is fulfilled, that rhyme in prophecy will ring abundantly clearer for those who have ears to hear in these last days. Join us next week as these three scholars discuss the greatest exodus promised to this chosen generation, the rapture of the church before the tribulation begins. This is Prophecy USA. My name is Rick Pearson. I'm reminding you that God's in control, Jesus is alive, and he's coming back much sooner than many people think. Have a great week. Shalom.